everyone. In this lecture, we're going to talk about chemistry and biological molecules, and I'm going to focus on biological molecules. So in the last two lectures, we talked about cells. We talked about prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, and we talked about the different components of cells. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what happens when you break cells even further at the molecular level, what makes up cells. And the main components, the organic compounds that we are going to talk about that make up all cells, whether you're a human cell or a plant cell or a bacterial cell, they are carbohydrates, which are sugars, lipids, which are fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. And then we're also going to talk about the energy molecule of the cell, which is ATP. But there are four organic molecules. Again, I want everyone to know them. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And it's these four big molecules or macromolecules, macro means big, that make up all cells. These are the things that make up the cell membrane and the flagella and the nucleus and the mitochondria and eukaryotic cells. So this is why a lot of you may think, okay, I know that we have to get carbohydrates and fats and proteins in our diet. And the reason is your cells are not healthy. They will not be functioning without these molecules. So this lecture is going to, we're going to skip the chemistry slides. I put them there for you if you want to review it because chemistry is a prereq for this class. And we're going to jump into talking about biological molecules. Again, we're talk, going to talk about proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And then we will end with talking about just the energy molecule of the cell, which is ATP. So here are your chemistry slides and you all have this PowerPoint. You guys have access to this, so I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start off with water. So when we look at cells, all cells, the most prevalent molecule in all cells is water. This is why scientists say that when they go to a new planet and they're looking for life, they look for water. We're going to talk about why water is the most important molecule, but just keep in mind that all living organisms are about 70% water and the water component is mainly the cytoplasm. So you have your cell membrane and then the cytoplasm is everything in the cell. It's mainly water. Water is an important molecule and it has a lot of properties because of its structure, because of the H2O molecule. It's important to know the chemistry of the H2O molecule to understand why it's important. And as a review, if any of you have forgotten this from chemistry, the bonds within a water molecule, the sharing of electrons, those are covalent bonds. And then water also forms bonds between each of um, the different molecules. So between two water molecules or three water molecules, these are called hydrogen bonds. But within a molecule, within the oxygen and hydrogen, that's a covalent bond. And just as a review, covalent bonds are the strongest bonds. So water is very important for life. And the reason why water is important for life is mainly due to three reasons. One, water is an important solvent. So solvent from chemistry means a solution that dissolves other things. You guys know that when we want to dissolve like salt and sugar, we dissolve it in water. It dissolves things very fairly quickly. And this is important for cells to function properly, that things can be dissolved or they can be put in solution. Another reason why water is important is because it acts as a temperature buffer, meaning that your cells or you yourself, if we were to Think of humans, but whatever I'm saying to humans, think of for bacteria and all other organisms, you don't, your cells don't freeze and boil based on the temperature outside. And that's because they're mostly water and water is a buffer. So we can start off the day at 40 degrees Celsius here in California. And then midday, it's like 80 degrees. Um, sorry, let's go back to Fahrenheit. So you can start off the day at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very cold, and then end the day at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is warm, and your body stays is at relatively the same temperature. And again, if your cells were mostly alcohol, like ethanol, they would boil as soon as it got hot, because alcohol is very flammable. And as soon as it's a little bit cold, they would freeze. So water is a great solvent, it's a temperature buffer. And then finally, the third reason why water is so important for life is water is very, very important for chemical reactions. It can act as 
both an acid or a base. So in solution, if you have an acid, water will act as a base. And if you have a base, water will act as an acid. And this is important. This is why in like, for example, in chemistry class or any other lab, if you cut your finger or you get something in your eye, we always say wash it with water because water will make acids and bases less reactive. Now I want to cover pH. If anyone has any more questions about water properties, I went over it quickly, but if you have more questions, please let me know. Now we're going to cover pH. So pH, that word pH, a lot of you may be aware of it as a measure of how acidic something is or how basic a solution is, but the definition of pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions or protons in a solution. So it's a concentration of hydrogen ions, which are H pluses in a solution we call pH. And when we look at the pH scale, it goes from 0 to 14. Neutral pH is pH 7. Anything below 7 is acidic pH. Anything above 7 is basic pH. Now, below 7 is acidic pH. So the most acidic pH is a pH of 0 or 1. And then a pH of 14 is extremely basic. And again, as a review from chemistry, the definition of an acid is something that releases is protons or hydrogen ions, which mean the same thing. The definition of a base is something that um, accepts protons. That's why when you mix an acid and a base, you get water because one will donate a proton and one will accept the proton. And then the log scale goes from 0 to 14. The take home message I want everyone to get from this slide because it's a biology class is that the pH scale is 0 to 14. Basic pH is pH 7, below 7 is considered acidic pH, above 7 is considered a basic pH. And for example, like lemon juice is around pH 2, it's acidic. When we think of uh, cleaners like bleach, they're in like pH 12, pH 13. So acidic pHs and basic pHs can kill cells. Most cells like to grow around pH six or eight. So when you grow cells in lab, like as a scientist, if you're growing cells, we measure the pH of the solution to make sure that it stays neutral. So now I'm going to get into what the focus of this lecture is. The focus of this lecture is organic molecules. Organic molecules Biological molecules and macromolecules all mean the same thing. And let me go back to that slide. So the different organic molecules that we are going to talk about are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And they're called organic molecules because all of them have carbon in them. The word organic, not like fruit organic, but in science, when we say organic, we mean that they're carbon-based organisms. So protein, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids all have a lot of carbon in them. And then we will talk about ATP just at the end of lecture. Okay, so these four macromolecules make up our cells. And so these Macro, they're big molecules. Proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids are big molecules. And so we call them macromolecules. Macromolecules are big molecules. They're made up of individual units that we call monomers. When you put all the monomers together, you get a polymer. So polymer means many monomers. So when I tell you what is the monomer of carbohydrates, I mean, what is the individual unit? What is the polymer of carbohydrates? What is it called when I put all those individual units together? So I want everyone to know the difference of monomers and polymers. Again, monomer is just a one subunit. What are the subunits that make up these macromolecules? Polymers are if you put those monomers together. This lecture kind of starts out hard and as you get midway or towards the end, things will start to make more sense. So just bear with me. And here's a summary. We're going to cover this in detail. Carbohydrates are made up of monosaccharide monomers. Proteins are made up of amino acid monomers. Lipids are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. Nucleic acids, which are DNA and RNA, are made up of nucleotides. And again, when I say monomers, I mean when you go to a carbohydrate and you break it down to its individual units, it's made up of monosaccharides. Like a good test question here would be, what are the monomers of proteins? And the answer is amino acids. And we're going to cover this in detail.
So how do we build and break down these big biological molecules? I want everyone to know two types of reactions. To build biological molecules, we do a dehydration reaction. Or a dehydration reaction is a synthesis reaction. Synthesis means to build. So when we want to make a carbohydrate or a polymer, we do a dehydration reaction. And the reason why it's called a dehydration reaction is when you put all the monomers together to build or synthesize a big molecule, you lose a molecule of water. So it's dehydration. When we want to take a polymer or a macromolecule and we want to break it apart or lyse it, that's called a hydrolysis reaction. And when we want to break molecules, we add water. So that's why it's called a hydrolysis reaction. Hydro for water, lyse. So hydrolysis reaction is a reaction that we use to break macromolecules. To build macromolecules, we use a dehydration reaction. So remember, the synthesis reaction, the building reaction is called a dehydration reaction. The breaking apart reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction. And so this is a good video to explain it all. Most biological molecules are very large and are built by assembling small molecules, or monomers, into long chains. The resulting molecules are called macromolecules, or polymers. A process of linking monomers, called dehydration synthesis, involves the removal of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom to form water. So everyone, the take home message from this is when we want to build a molecule, like when we want to build a lipid or a protein or a carbohydrate or a nucleic acid, the reaction we do is called a dehydration synthesis reaction. One way this might happen is diagrammed here, where several generic monomers are shown with OH groups that could be used for linking. The animation illustrates the joining together of monomers by dehydration synthesis, catalyzed by a polymerase enzyme, and the reverse process, in which added water results in hydrolysis. So to break a molecule, the reaction is called hydrolysis. That's it. That's take home message. So anytime I ask you on a test, if we want to break a molecule, what's the reaction called? I want you to say hydrolysis. If we want to build a molecule, the reaction is called dehydration synthesis. And so now we're going to cover each one, each of the macromolecules. So hopefully now things will start to get a little bit easier now that we've covered these terms. So the first main molecule that makes up all cells out of the four macromolecules is protein. That's what we're going to cover. So protein is the most common biological molecule or organic molecule or macromolecule that we see in our cells. It has many different functions. So 99.9% .9 of enzymes are proteins, and enzymes are molecules that speed up chemical reactions. Molecules are also transporter. Uh, proteins are also important in transport. Remember when we talked about the cell membrane, we said that there's proteins in the cell membrane, so a protein also functions for transport. Protein also makes the structure of cells. So the cytoskeleton, for example, is made up of protein. Flagella in both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells is made up of protein. And then some bacteria make toxins that are proteins, cell structures that are proteins, and then your body antibodies that your body makes to fight infection, those are proteins. So the protein has many different functions. So know these functions, if I ask you on a test, list a few functions of proteins. The structure of proteins is that it's made up of carbon, like all of them, because they're all organic molecules, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and then some proteins have sulfur in them. When we take a protein and we hydrolyze it, meaning break it down when we do hydrolysis reaction, the monomers that proteins are made up of are amino acids, and there are 20 different amino acids. So here's a good video explaining proteins. Most proteins are folded into a complex globular shape. Each protein molecule consists of one or more chains of amino acid monomers. The amino acids are linked by peptide bonds, so a protein polymer is often called a polypeptide. Because they are so complicated, proteins are usually described in terms of four levels of structure. 
So we're going to talk about the levels of ch structure with protein, but I want to go back to talking about amino acids. So proteins are made up of amino acids, all protein in the world. If you, if anyone drinks protein shakes, they're basically a bunch of amino acids put together. If you look at the ingredients. So again, if we hydrolyze a protein, it's made up of amino acids. When we look at amino acids, there's 20 different amino acids with different properties, some are more acidic, some are more basic. And so when we look at an amino acid, all amino acids have an amino group, which is a nitrogen based group, a carboxyl group and a side group that makes them different. That's why we have 20 different amino acids. To give you to give some of you um, a better idea of protein, for example, protein um, hair is made up of keratin. Keratin is a protein, but when you look at people's hair, people have different types of hair. People who have curlier hair have more of the cysteine amino acid in their hair than other amino acids. So that's the idea. So different uh, amino acids give protein different properties. That's why some people have more straight hair and some people have more curly hair. People who have curly hair have more cysteine in their hair and the cysteine does sulfur bonds with each other that creates that curl. So again, there's 20 amino acids, the side group is different, and the amino acids, some are nonpolar, some are polar, some are charged. And so depending on the amino acids you put together, it will determine what protein you get. So the structure of protein, the bond between the amino acids is called the peptide bond. I want everyone to know that moving forward, peptide means protein. It's the same exact thing. So peptide, polypeptide, protein all mean the same thing. The order of amino acids in protein is called the primary structure of a protein. That's all that means. We say that protein has four levels of structure. If someone tells you what's the primary structure of a protein, they're just asking you what's the order of amino acids. So for example, this protein here is made up of the amino acid glycine and alanine. You put them together through a dehydration synthesis reaction and the bond between the amino acids is called a peptide bond. If I wanna break the protein, I would do a hydrolysis reaction. And here's Each protein has a unique structure. primary structure. A particular number and sequence of amino acids making up the polypeptide chain. 20 different amino acids are used to build proteins. Theoretically, the various amino acids could be linked in almost any sequence, forming an almost infinite variety of different proteins. This illustration shows some of the amino acids making up the primary structure of a protein. The structure of a single generalized amino acid is shown below. So again, primary structure just means the order of amino acids. And we have primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Proteins have four levels of structure. And the primary structure is just the order of amino acids. The secondary structure is how the amino acids fold with each other, creating a helix or something called a beta pleated sheet, the beta pleated sheet, which looks like this. Tertiary structure is when the helices and the sheets form bonds with each other. And then the quaternary structure consists of multiple peptides put together. So these are the four different levels of protein structure. In proteins, I want everyone to know that proteins can denature. Denature means that they change shape. And if they change shape or structure, they lose their function. The most important thing in the functioning of a protein is that their structure stays intact. Things that can cause a protein to denature or change structure is temperature, like a high fever. That's why fevers can be bad because fevers for a very long time, excessively at high temperature can cause proteins in your brain to denature. If they start denaturing, they stop functioning and doing the things that they're supposed to do. Other things that can denature proteins are pH. Like if you put, put a cell in too acidic of a solution or too basic of a solution, proteins will change structure and denature. And then salt can also denature a protein. 
An, an example of how important structure is for protein is there is prion disease, which we will talk about later in the structure. So an improperly folded protein is called a prion, and a prion can lead to devastating brain diseases that we will talk about. So if anyone's heard of mad cow disease, which we call bovine spongiform encephalopathy, it is due to a protein that misfolded that can cause a lot of other proteins in the brain to misfold and this can have devastating outcomes the kuru and different diseases that we see in animals which we will cover okay so that was proteins so the take-home message of proteins is that proteins are a biological molecule their monomers are amino acids if you hydrolyze a protein, you get amino acids. To build a protein together, we do a dehydration synthesis and the bond between proteins is called the peptide bond. And then finally, if I ask you what are various functions of protein, you could say transport in cell membranes, uh, different cell components such as flagella, enzymes, which is the most important one, and various other functions like holding cell structure in the cytoskeleton. Now we're going to talk about the next most important molecule or biological molecule we see in cells and that is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates means sugars and anything that ends in O-S-E is a sugar. So glucose, lactose, sucrose, maltose, fructose. If you're ever reading a food label, food labels don't write sugar anymore because they know that people think too much sugar is bad. So now they write the chemical term and a lot of people don't know this, but anything ending in OSC is a sugar. So the function of carbohydrates or sugars is that they're important for energy, for short and long-term energy. That's the function of carbohydrates. When we look at the structure, they are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and we see them in simple and complex forms. The monomer of carbohydrates, if you take a carbohydrate and you hydrolyze it, meaning break it apart by adding water, carbohydrates are made up of monosaccharides, individual sugar units. An example of a monosaccharide is glucose. So when we want to build a carbohydrate, we do a dehydration synthesis reaction and you lose water. So if we take the monomer glucose and the monomer fructose and we put them together through a dehydration reaction, we get a disaccharide, a double sugar called sucrose. This monomer is called a monosaccharide. This monomer is called a mo another monosaccharide. We put them together, we get a disaccharide. So again, dehydration reaction is to build uh, polysaccharides and disaccharides. And when we want to break apart a polysaccharide, we do a hydrolysis reaction. So if we want to look at lactose, lactose is a disaccharide and it's made up of glucose and galactose. You put them together through a dehydration synthesis reaction because we'll, we're building. So here I'm just showing you how, again, to build a disaccharide, we do a dehydration synthesis reaction. To break apart a disaccharide or a polysaccharide, we just do a hydrolysis reaction. Sometimes organisms link sugar molecules in pairs to form disaccharides. Here are several examples. Plants make sucrose by joining glucose and fructose. Sucrose circulates in plant sap and we obtain it from sugar cane and sugar beets and use it as table sugar. Lactose is formed by joining galactose and glucose. Lactose is the disaccharide that gives milk its sweet taste. Maltose consists of two linked... So I think you guys get the point. When you put two monosaccharides together when you're building, we do a dehydration reaction. When we're breaking, we do a hydrolysis reaction. So we have polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are complex sugars. Poly means many. It means that we put many sugar units together. By the way, I forgot to mention saccharide in Latin means sweet. So that's where that term came from. So the polysaccharides consist of tens of hundreds or many, many monosaccharides put together through a dehydration synthesis reaction. And so different examples of polysaccharides or complex sugars are cellulose, glycogen, starch, and dextrin. We're going to talk about dextrin when we talk about cavities. Um, we're going to talk about the sugar that helps bacteria stick to each other and surfaces. And there's many other polysaccharides.
Polysaccharides are polymers, long chains consisting of hundreds to thousands of linked monosaccharides. So the summary of carbohydrates is we have carbohydrates. Their function is short-term and long-term energy. They're, when we look at the monomers of carbohydrates, they're made up of monosaccharides. When we want to build a polysaccharide, we put all the monosaccharides together and we put them together and do a dehydration synthesized reaction to synthesize or build a polysaccharide or a complex sugar. Now we're going to talk about lipids. Lipids are nonpolar hydrophobic insoluble molecules. Lipid just means fats and their function is in long-term energy. They're the primary components of cell membranes and you see them in fats and oils and steroids. But if I ask you the function of a lipid on a test, I want everyone to say long-term energy because they're harder to break down and that they make the primary component of cell membrane. So the structure, they're hydrophobic, they're made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. And there's various monomers, so if you take a lipid and you hydrolyze it or you break it down, it's mostly fatty acids, glycerol and fatty acids, but it depends on the lipid that you're breaking down. Butter, lard, margarine, and salad oil are composed of lipids called fats. To make a fat molecule, three fatty acids bind to a molecule of glycerol. For this reason, fat molecules are technically called triglycerides. Fat molecules do not mix with water because they have three long nonpolar hydrocarbon tails. Cells use fats for energy storage because the tails hold more potential energy than other biological molecules. The fatty acid tails in a fat can vary in length. A very important characteristic of fats is the number of double bonds in the hydrocarbon tails. Fats that contain only single bonds are called saturated fats. Fats containing double bonds in one or more tails are called unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats tend to be liquid at room temperature. If anyone was wondering why we say that saturated fats are kind of like the bad fat and unsaturated fats are not. So saturated fats is when you have a carbon saturated with hydrogen. So there's no double, double bonds in saturated fats. So this is an example right here. If we just look at this chain, not this one, even though this is a whole molecule. So saturated fat is when there's no double bonds. Carbons are saturated with hydrogens around them. The reason why saturated fats are bad or what we call the worst fat is because saturated fats can nicely stack on top of each other and this can cause health problems because for example imagine this happening in an artery this is why they're bad unsaturated fats have double bonds in them the double bond creates a little bend in the molecule kind of like here so they cannot stack on top of each other nicely so for example unsaturated fat is oil oil like all of oil is healthier than like ghee or lard so that's the main difference and then trans fats are an unnatural way of getting fats to basically look like saturated fats and the reason why they're bad is that they're not natural so your body doesn't know what to do with them so that was lipids. So there's simple lipids, fats, or triglycerides. Triglycerides are lipids. Their monomers are made up of glycerol and fatty acids. You can be saturated or unsaturated. And triglycerides are important for long-term energy. And then here to summarize, saturated fats have no double bonds in the fatty acids, so they just not stack on top of each other nicely. And this is why they can lead too much saturated fat can be bad because it can lead to heart attacks. And then unsaturated fat is when we have one or more double bonds in the fatty acid. So by having these double bonds, when you eat a lot of unsaturated fat, for example, they don't stack on top of each other nicely because uh, they're bent because of the double bond. And then trans fats, which now food companies call hydrogenated fats because now the world is aware that trans fats are bad. So what food companies do now is in the US, we still use trans fats, but we call them hydrogenated fats because people don't know what that is, but it's the same thing. Trans fats are when you 
unnaturally try to create a bend in the molecule so that you can get your food to last longer. And it's not a health class, but it is very fascinating to learn about. So again, here are complex lipids or fats. Remember we said that cell membranes are made up of phospholipids? That's why lipids are important in our cells. You need fat in your diet to make your cell membranes. Same with bacteria and all other organisms. Cell membranes are made up of these complex lipids called phospholipids, which have glycerol and fatty acids. Another example of a lipid besides the fatty acids, the phospholipids that we see in cell membranes are steroids. Steroids are fats and they do not have fatty acids. They're made up of four fused carbon rings together. And the function is they keep part of the membrane fluid, meaning that they make sure that your membrane still allows things in and out. So cholesterol, we see cholesterol in animal cells not in plant cells, not in prokaryotic cells. Cholesterol is a type of steroid or fat that stabilizes cell membranes so that you do not get a cell membrane to be too tight or too loose. You get the perfect um, fluidity of the cell membrane. And then sex hormones are another example of a steroid, they're fats. So with testosterone and estrogen. So we've covered lipids. Okay, so let's summarize lipids. The function of lipids as a macromolecule is long-term energy, and we see them in cell membranes. The, if we take the monomers of lipids, besides steroids, they're made up of fatty acids and glycerol. So that's what they're made up of. Now we're gonna talk about the final biological molecule, which is nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are DNA or RNA, and their function is genetic information, so genetic instruction. Their function is to make protein or just the genetic information of the cell. Examples of nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. We'll learn all about RNA later. Most of you have heard of DNA. They're both important genetic molecules of the cell that tell the cell how it's going to function, what it's going to look like. The structure of nucleic acids are they're made up of nucleotides. So if I ask you, if you take a nucleic acid and you hydrolyze it or you break it down into its individual monomers, what is it made up of? I want everyone to tell me that nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. And nucleotides, if you break them down even further, they're made up of three things, an nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. So we're going to talk about DNA versus RNA. Both nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides as their monomer. When we look at DNA versus RNA, DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. We're going to learn all about them later, why this matters, but just know this for now. The sugar that we see in DNA is called deoxyribose. That's where the D comes from, DNA. It's called deoxyribose nucleic acid. And the sugar that we see in RNA is ribose. The base bonding that we see in DNA is the nitrogenous base adenine always binds to the nitrogenous base thymine. The nitrogenous base cytosine always binds to nitrogenous base guanine. In RNA, there is no thymine, there is no T. So adenine always binds to your cell and cytosine always binds to guanine. So in both of them, C binds to G, but in RNA, there is no T. So A binds to you, which is your cell. And we'll talk all in a lot of detail about this later on. So uh, now I summarize nucleic acids. I want everyone to know that nucleic acids, their function is the genetic information of the cell and the monomer that makes nucleic acid is nucleotides. Now we're gonna end the lecture by talking about ATP, which is different than the four macromolecules we mentioned, but we are talking about molecules, so I thought we'd learn about it here. ATP is the en energy currency of the cell. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. And if anyone remembers from chemistry, so adenosine triphosphate has three phosphate groups together. Phosphate groups are very highly negatively charged. They don't wanna be next to each other. So to force three phosphate groups together takes a lot of energy. So the molecule ATP has a lot of potential energy because those phosphate groups don't wanna be next to each other. So that's why it's the energy function, it's the energy molecule of the cell because every time you release a phosphate group, you get energy.
And the structure of adenosine triphosphate is there is an adenosine group, an adenine base, ribose sugar, and three phosphate groups, which are high energy bonds, negatively charged, and we break the phosphate groups to get energy. So ATP will release energy and become ADP, which stands for adenosine diphosphate. Adenosine diphosphate will release some energy and become adenosine monophosphate. So you go ATP, ADP, AMP. And here is a nice summary. This is what I expect you to know from this lecture. I want everyone to know that the four macromolecules of cells, the four most important molecules of cells, this is why we need to eat all of these things, are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. I want you to know the function of each on a test. So the function of carbohydrates is short-term energy, if I were to summarize this. The function of lipids are long-term energy. And for carbohydrates, I apologize, I would put short-term energy energy and long-term energy. Lipids is just long-term energy, and also we see them in cell membranes. Proteins function as enzymes, function in transport, structure, storage. Nucleic acids function in genetic information storage. The monomers that make up carbohydrates are monosaccharides. The monomers that make up lipids are fatty acids and glycerol. The monomers that make up proteins are amino acids. The monomers that make up nucleic acids are nucleotides. And examples of carbohydrates are starch, cellulose, sucrose. Examples of lipids are fats, phospholipids that we see in cell membranes. Examples of proteins are any enzyme. Enzymes all end in ASE, so lactase is the enzyme that breaks the sugar lactose. Hemoglobin is a protein. Antibodies are examples of proteins. Examples of nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. So here is another image showing you what we talked about. So what I want everyone, the take home message I want everyone to know is know what pH is, know the different macromolecules, know what the monomers are, the function, the structure of each of these. And this is a good table to know for your test. So know the difference between all of the monomers and the function of each and hopefully everything here made sense with you.